Hello, my name's Sam, my pronouns are they them, and welcome to another one of my offices. Um, so we're at my day job right now, it's Saturday. I'm, I'm doing some extra work this weekend, I don't normally work on Saturdays, but I gotta get some stuff done. It's like 7am, um, so welcome to the weekend ween reading vlog. Um, so I'm not starting until I get home from work um, because the things that I want to read for this weekend are both physical and I need to work right now. And I know that Weekend Weaned is technically like Friday through Monday, um, but I'm only doing Saturday and Sunday because I have extra work to do, I have to prep for Nano, um, I have to do like some filming and stuff to give me some backup content for Nano, like all that fun stuff. So that's the plan. Welcome to the real start of my weekend ween. It's hosted by Olivia Reads a Latte and Gabby Reads. Um, mine is gonna be a little bit altered to what, in comparison to what they're doing. Um, just because I've got a lot of stuff going on right now that I'm really excited about. Um, so I'm basically going to be doing the equivalent of a 24-hour readathon. Um, it's 3.30 on Saturday and I am just <laughs> about to get started reading. Yeah, I'm about 30 pages into my reread of Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. Um, this is technically the last book on my spooky TBR. Um, so this one I have to finish. I just have to. Um, and then I also have an ebook for The House Across the Lake by Riley Sagar. Um, I put in a hold for that ebook like back in July. Um, <laughs> so this has come at the absolute most perfect timing. So I have to finish that as well. And those are the two books that I'm hoping to get done within this 24 hour readathon. Um, I'm going to try and stay up as much as I possibly can and you know I don't think that I'm gonna actually be able to do like a whole 24 hours with no sleep um, but I'm gonna do my best and if I can finish those two books I'm gonna count it as a success. I'm only gonna do two out of the four prompts so it's weekend we in the monster mash this year. Um, there is let a coin toss decide your first read, which I'm not doing because I already started this, uh, like yesterday. Um, read a book with a monster in it or a monster on the cover. So this is going to count as my one with a monster in it. Um, and I'm saying that because there are monstrous acts in it. Um, and it's also, there are a lot of like horrible topics about it. So there's not literally a monster. Um, per se, but there is figuratively definitely monsters all throughout it. Um, listen to a spooky audiobook or read a horror graphic novel uh, slash manga. I won't be doing that one because I don't have any audiobooks that are spooky right now. And there is read a book in the dark or at night, which I will do. So I'm pretty excited for this. Um, I know it's like a very condensed version of their readathon, but I really wanted to participate. Um, but I just don't have the time to do a full four days. So I'm gonna get started. Okay, hi. Um, so I need to make myself a latte, but I've decided to break up um, how I talk to everyone about Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. Um, so this is a book of short stories that she wrote, um, and there are eight of them. So I think that I'm going to stop and kind of talk about each one individually and I think that's going to be the best way to do this. Um, so, so far I've read two because I read 
the husband stitch um yesterday so i guess we'll start with the husband stitch okay so the husband stitch is about it's a story about this woman who um you're kind of walking through her life and she meets her husband at 17 um and she's completely enamored and whatever whatever um but she has this one thing she has this green ribbon that's tied around the back of her neck um and she never ever gives her husband like an explanation for what it is or why it's there so at first he kind of allows everything to just kind of go on as it's been going um but he slowly over the years like starts to get a little bit touchy with the ribbon and she gets very upset about it uh, and she's like you have everything for me i keep our home the way it is like i love you i give you everything that you could ever want um why can't you just let this be mine and his thought process is always like you're my wife you shouldn't hide anything from me there shouldn't be any lies and she's just like there aren't any lies this is just something that's mine of course he ends up at one point like poking at the ribbon more and she's just like fine do you really want this and he's like yes this is what i want um and he pulls on the ribbon and off comes her head and he's just like sobbing afterwards because his inability to respect his wife in any capacity um, and treat her as an individual and not as solely a mother and his plaything um, ultimately has caused him to lose everything. And oh boy, that one's, I love that one so much. So for that one, that one gets five out of five stars for that story. And we're kind of going to keep track. I've never kept track of these stories as individuals. Uh, I've just done the collection as a whole. So I'm kind of curious to see what I think of them individually. Um, so I just read Inventory. So Inventory is told through like different people that this person is having sex with and like the different experiences of having sex with them throughout their life. Um, and it starts when she's like very young, when she's a child and it's not that they're having sex, but they're having like sex, sexual exploration kind of vibes. So that's kind of how it starts. And then it moves into like actually having sex, like as an adult. Um, and slowly a epidemic, um, is introduced and then I'm making foam. Um, it ends up turning into like a story of this woman running, running from this virus, this disease, um, told through her sexual encounters. And it was really good. I really liked the format of it. I think it's really interesting to tell that kind of a story just through, um, like, different sexual partners how they are what your experiences are like what kind of trauma you've taken from them basically like and like just when you think that she's met her happy ever after kind of vibe that's uh, certainly not the case so yeah that's where we're at so far it's really good um i'm gonna give inventory honestly i think five out of five stars too just for how interesting the formatting is um and it's such a cool way to tell a story. So the next one that I am reading is called Mothers. Um, so I'll check in with you when I am done with that one. So sorry if you can hear my space heater in the background, but my feet are very cold. So we're gonna live with it. Um, so I just finished Mothers. And I've never really known exactly how to take this one, per se. So, like, I start out reading it, and I kind of imagine it to be the scene of, like, a nurse handing over a baby. Um, because you've got this person who just walked into this person's house handing a baby, like, carrying a baby, and hands it to her. And is like, here, this is yours now. And she's just like, what? And she's like... Well, I can only do so much. And then she basically just leaves. Um, and she leaves this baby with this woman. Um, but then it 
and that that feels definitely like a nurse handing over a baby um I mean I guess I wouldn't know I don't have babies I, I don't like children um, for the most part um but then it like starts to break down into this um it's like female female relationship and there's pregnancy involved and it kind of breaks down into like more of a physically and emotionally abusive relationship um, and kind of the trauma and the like harm that is done and is everlasting because of this emotionally and physically abusive relationship that this woman was in um, with this other woman who she calls bad um, and part of it feels like this baby is like a hallucination or it might be like a remembrance of you know maybe they had a child and said child got killed or blah 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 I have no idea at the end of this I don't understand it I don't understand the story I don't understand like the message that's supposed to be told in this one this one's always confused me and I think that has a lot to do with like me getting stuck on like the motherhood aspects of it um, because that that concept has always really confused me in as a whole um, but I'm still giving it a four star like it's beautifully written it's beautifully written it's compelling it's interesting to read but it's just one of those things where like I've thought about this and thought about this and I read this multiple times and I still cannot like fully parse out what she's trying to say. I feel like I get bits and pieces of it but I can never like get the full reality of what she's trying to get at with the ending of like the children and these two other people walking into this cabin that she's waiting for like like this is like a past life of hers that she's trying to get back to but ultimately never is. I don't know. I'm gonna take more time to think about it. And maybe I'll come to like a revelation at the end of this vlog. You never know. Maybe I'll be able to work through it. Um, but so f next I'm going on to Especially Heinous, um, which is one of the longest ones in this collection. Um, I think it's almost like 60 pages. So time to get started on that. Okay, hello. Um, so right now it's 6.22, so I've been reading for about three hours, give or take times to make coffees. Um, and I just finished Especially Heinous. Um, and I forgot how weird this one was. So this one is all about, like, a breakdown. You get maybe, like, generally speaking, like a sentence or a paragraph of a breakdown of an episode of um, Law and Order SVU um, but it's and it goes through like 11 seasons but it's not actually what happens in Law and Order SVU in any capacity um, it's like this weird supernatural kind of thing and there are doppelgangers of Benson and Stabler and there are dead girls with bells for like eyeballs all up in Benson's brain and Stabler's just Stabler's just as weird as ever I mean oh, let's be real here I'm not a Stabler stan in any capacity um I, I feel like that was a that was a fairly accurate representation of his character for the most part um just kind of being a little bit too brutal but so it's just kind of like a depiction of New York City as like there are gods or something that are like controlling the city and like the streets are breathing and it's kind of just like the idea of you feed the creature what the city gives you and the city therefore pushes more of that back out and it feeds the city and it's like this whole big cycle um, of just like consistent violence against women and like a complete disregard like a normalization of what's going on with them it's a hard one to read but it was it was a really good one i'm gonna give it like four and a half stars so next i'm gonna start real women have bodies hello so right now it's 7:32. i finished real women have bodies 
Um, and then I had to feed the dog, and then I had to take the dog out. So, a couple things have happened. Um, real women have bodies. It's about this girl who works at this dress store in the mall, like prom dresses, stuff like that. Um, and the she kind of falls into this fling with the dressmaker's daughter. And all of this happens while they're kind of in this... I don't know if I want to call it like a pandemic or epidemic um, of women who are fading. So when I say fading, I mean they are literally fading. They, you start to be able to see through their skin, to see like their bone structure and their muscle until they become fully transparent. Um, you can like reach through them. They're, they're basically not there. They're kind of ghostly. Um, and it's happening more and more, and these faded women are becoming, like, what society calls a real problem, because if you can't touch them, how can you trust them? So it's, it's a sense putting the physicality of women as, like, their number one priority of what makes a woman valuable, that kind of vibe. Um... I'm getting off track, but these faded women, they kind of choose places to like haunt. Um, some people are saying that they're protesting, they're messing with like electrical systems and voting booths and stuff like that. Um, but then you have other women who cling to things such as dresses. So um, the dressmaker's daughter shows her partner what the dressmaker does at the motel that they own and it's kind of this scene of these faded women who are coming to them they're not speaking they're not saying anything they're just kind of clinging to these dresses and they eventually get sewn into these dresses and then it's kind of like this idea that these women make these dresses worth more money. People don't realize that the faded women are sewn into these dresses and yet the dresses that have the faded women sewn into them um, sell for a higher value. So it's really coming in and talking about like the worth of women um, in society, like their physicality. If they're not faded they're valued because they're physical. You can touch them, you can interact with them um, in a physical manner, but these women after they have faded, you know, their physicality, even though they are transparent, you can t go through them. Um, you can't like feel them at all. They treat them like they are not people in any capacity and yet their physicality is still something that makes certain things more valuable without people realizing and you know they're still putting value into their physical actions. Um, it's all really interesting and obviously this is a 5 out of 5 for me. I, I've read it so many times that I just, I pick something else up every single time that I read it and I feel like my interpretations of it have really changed throughout the years. So uh, I'm gonna move on to 8 Bytes. I have three more stories to go. So, check in once 8 Bytes is done. So I just finished 8 Bytes and I forgot how much this one hurt. This one is about four sisters. Um, they're all adults and each one has had um, some form of a gastric bypass surgery. So we're following the fourth sister, the last one, as she chooses to get the surgery and her inner tor turmoil with herself her post children um and she her daughter's like in her 20s so it's not like she's very recently post having a child it, this is 20 years living in this body and watching her all three of her sisters get the surgery and become themselves basically and it's this is like pretty severe like eating disorder trigger warning um for this one it it, this one's rough to read. There's one line where she's talking to her daughter on the phone and her daughter is just like, do you hate my body too? Um, my body looks just like yours used to. 
because this is post this woman's surgery and the woman just ends up like hanging up on her daughter and disconnecting the call like disconnecting her phone so she physically could not call her anymore. Um, it also goes into how generational eating disorders are kind of passed down. So like this woman's mother had a specific eight bite policy for herself and how that mentality has kind of passed down to her children. Um, and kind of how that mentality is then passed on to the next generation of children, but this woman's daughter, um, she, this woman feels resentment towards her daughter, um, even if she really won't, like, fully admit to it, she feels resentment towards her, um, and she says some, like, backhanded things about this, her daughter going to therapy, and, you know, trying to, to break that mentality, break that, that cycle of generational, um, ultimately, like, trauma impact, I guess. But I think the most interesting thing about this is, like, the way that things are kind of played with after. So there are these creature, there's this creature, like, going through this woman's house. And it's kind of like a humanoid creature. And she asks her sisters, was something, were you seeing things after your surgery? And so the first sister says, my joy danced around my house like a child and I danced with her. The second sister says, my inner beauty was set free and lay around in patches of sunlight like a cat preening itself. And the third sister said, my former shame slunk from shadow to shadow as it should have. It will go away after a while. You won't even notice, and then one day it'll be gone. So you've got these humanoid creatures that are coming around, and there's this scene where this woman finally finds her humanoid creature in her basement and is like beating it with a broom, only to realize many years later, like, this is the piece of herself that she lost, kind of, in, in her surgery process. You know, it's like, what was so wrong with that piece of yourself that you felt the need to throw it away so violently. Um, and one of the final lines, which I think is one of my favorite lines in the entire book, I was referring to this woman when she's like almost 80. Um, arms will lift me from my bed, her arms. They will be mother soft like dough and moss. I will recognize the smell. I will flood with grief and shame. I will look where her eyes would be, I will open my mouth to ask, but then realize the question has answered itself. By loving me when I did not love her, by being abandoned by me, she has become immortal. She will outlive me by a hundred million years, more even. She will outlive my daughter and my daughter's daughter, and the earth will teem with her and her kind, their inscrutable forms and unknowable destinies. She will touch my cheek like I once did Cal's so long ago, and there will be no accusation in it. I will cry as she shuffles me away from myself towards a door propped open into the salty morning. I will curl into her body, which was my body once, but I was a poor caretaker, and she was removed from my charge. I'm sorry, I will whisper into her as she walks me towards the front door. I'm sorry, I will repeat, I didn't know. Like, are you kidding me? God, Carmen Maria Machado is the the most amazing fucking writer. I just, it's like you, you, it literally takes like 30 years to like understand the part of herself that she despised so much was just a piece of herself trying to like keep her alive. And she just threw so much hatred and cruelty at it and it will like suffer the consequences of her actions. It was so, so good. Five out of five stars. Six out of five stars. The best. Um, okay, let's move on. So the next one is The Resident. So I'm gonna read that and get back to you. Okay, hello, good morning. So it's 7 a.m. right now and I just got up and got ready. I haven't done anything um, that I need to like with the dog or anything. But I wanted to very quickly talk about the last two stories that I read last night for Her Body and Other Parties. So let's see, there was The Resident, which was about this person who went to like 
an old mountain hotel turned residency to work on her novel with some other artists who were there. There was like a sculptor, a painter, a photographer. Honestly, out of all of them, I think that one was my least favorite of the bunch. I think that I, I enjoyed it still. Like there were some interesting concepts there playing between like her past and her present and you know the functionality of like working with other artists and the idea that like when you go into other artist space spaces you know they expect you to be a certain kind of way and if you don't fit that expectation then you're still considered the weird one out even in like a group full of artists who are supposed to be weird. I think it has some really interesting concepts there but yeah I felt like it was long and a little drawn out for me. Um, I still really liked it. I would probably give that one like a 3.75 because I, I did genuinely enjoy reading it, but in comparison to the other stories in this collection, it just didn't hit the mark like the other ones did. Um, and then the final one was Difficult at Parties, which was about a woman who, you know, there's the insinuation that she was sexually assaulted in her apartment. Um, and it's kind of like the aftermath of her and her partner. You know, what kind of goes on after? It was a hard one to read because it's like bringing back the expectations of this horrible thing has happened to you, um, but we have to like get back to normal at some point. Like you were so this before, you know, the before versus the after. And it was hard to read for that. Um, there are also like the one weird aspect there's always like at least one very odd aspect in each one of these stories and the one for difficult at parties is that her partner um pushes her to watch porn to get sexual desires back or something i don't know how that would work and she when she watches the movies the clips or whatever the videos um she can hear the people in the videos their thoughts not what they're saying out loud but she hears like what they're thinking in that moment um and she's kind of freaking out and she's like do you not hear that and he's like no it's kind of like the aftermath of like sexual violence and the the way that you look at sex after that kind of violation um and how different it feels with your partner, with everyday lives, with this, with that, and how it affects every single part of your existence. Honestly, I'm gonna give it a five stars. I really liked that one. Honestly, this entire collection, I'm still gonna keep it at five stars. Like, I know that each story in here was not a five star, but I think as a collection, they really fit well together and they tell a really comprehensive story of sexual violence and violence against women and emotional like abuse and relationships and it's not a traditional horror but I would definitely classify this as a horror and I still love it to this day I stand by that so last night I also started The House Across the Lake by Riley Sagar I'm only like 10% of the way through okay I gotta go get some coffee and feed the dog so I'll update later okay hello so I am gonna do my final thoughts and a quick wrap up for this because um, right now it's about four o'clock. I finished like an hour and a half ago, but I've just kind of been lazing around. Um, but I finished my weekend ween 24 hour reading blog and I succeeded. I finished reading The House Across the Lake by Riley Sagar at 2.30 and my my 24 hour readathon was 3 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Um, so I just made it. Yay! The House Across the Lake by Riley Sagar. I have such a love hate relationship with Riley Sagar. And by that, I mean I absolutely adored one book and I've kind of disliked the rest of them. And this one kind of stands the same, honestly. Um, but I will say with this one, 75% of the way through and my brain was just like, 
for the first time I got the, oh, this is giving spooky vibes. I'm 75% of the way through. Why is it giving spooky vibes? It usually comes up sooner than that. And I was totally expecting it to be like spooky vibes and then haha, -ha, not spooky, not haunted, not ghostly. Spoiler alert. It was spooky, scary skeletons, ghosty vibes. Um, and that was very unexpected for me. And, you know, I've been like, hoping that it would be for like four books that I've read so far from Riley Sagar and you know I thought I wanted it I don't think I wanted it I think that I was wrong I don't think I actually wanted it to be like ghosts I much prefer the twists when it's like ooh ghosts psych never mind it's totally un uh, realistic solution. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. This was not my least favorite. There was a point in this where I kept imagining that House Across the Lake was gonna kind of give off the vibes of One by One by Ruth Ware, which I read earlier this year, and I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Um, so I liked this one better than that. But it definitely gave off, like, similar, like, reasonings behind things. I really, I, I really just think that I can't do thrillers in any capacity. I think that's kind of what I come down to this year, because I feel like my most hated books of this year are, for the most part, thrillers. Um, and that sucks. That sucks so bad. Um... Because I've read so many thrillers this year in comparison to, like, previous years. That's where we're at with this. Um, we had a very, like, I knew it was going to be successful with Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado because I already have read it um, many, many times and I already knew that I loved it. Um, I really enjoyed getting to stop and, like, go through each story individually. That's not something that I've ever really done. Um, I usually will read like one story and then walk away or I'll read the entire thing and then I'll think about it. Um, so I enjoyed being able to do that. And then The House Across the Lake. I really didn't like the main character. And I know Riley Sagar definitely like writes unlikable main characters, but I don't know. I just, I didn't enjoy reading from her perspective. And like, that's not to say that I, if you've read this book, then you know, like, some of the things that she's done and some of the, like, actions she's taken against others. And like, I understand those. I feel, I feel that those are fairly justified. Um, like, the actions that she took. And I stand by her actions. Like, I don't think that she did, um like, the most horrible things you could possibly imagine, and I definitely see where her logic comes from with all of it, um, but, you know, this book is, let's see, 370 pages. I spent, like, six hours reading this on ebook. Like, the cover's beautiful, but did I really want to read from her perspective for 370 pages? Not really. I mean, it could have been worse. Obviously, it could have been worse. Like, look at how pretty it is. Ooh, come on, focus. It's very pretty cover. I really like Riley Sagar's covers. Don't really like the books very much. So, that's where we're at. I don't know, I'm probably gonna give it, like, a three star. It wasn't the worst thing I've ever read, obviously but it could have been better. Um, so that completes my weekend ween. I had so much fun the past 24 hours, honestly. Like, this was the best way to spend, like, a Saturday-Sunday combo for me. So I am super excited to head into November on a win in regards to my, my spooky season TBR. I feel very accomplished. Um, I will be putting out a video soon tier ranking my spooky TBR um, because I got through the entire thing and 
I've definitely refined my tastes. Um, so that will be coming out soon. And we are going to fly into November, fly into NaNoWriMo. I am so excited. I'm hoping to put out a little bit of content regarding my NaNoWriMo journey. This is like my first year really taking it seriously. Um, so that's coming up. And then I'm also planning on spending November like while I'm doing NaNoWriMo doing um, a lot of romance reading because that's like my easy fast like does good things to my brain reading. Um, so expect some romance content coming out for this comfy cozy winter season coming up. Expect some writing content coming out and I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of your weekend ween. I hope that everything's going super well and you are feeling amazing and ready to head into this nice wintry season. Mm -hmm.